Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday evening reflection. Bishop Ariel Santos here, and we would like to thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, and we would like to look back tonight on the celebration of the Feast of the Lord and Giver of Life last Sunday. Every third Sunday of the year, of January, our communion, the International Communion of the Charismatic Episcopal Church, celebrates uh, <clears throat> uh, what we used to call the Sanctity of Life. Now we call it the Feast of the Lord and Giver of Life along with many other churches and denominations, uh, especially in uh, the West, in, in, in uh, the U.S. January is, uh, you know, they, that, that's, that's uh, the month they chose. We, we coincided, well, it, the, we choose the, the nearest Sunday to January 21. If you know a little bit of history, uh, January 21 was the date, I think it was in 1971, 1972, the date when uh, the U.S. Supreme Court came up with, uh, decided on the, the Roe versus Wade case. And that was the, like, a, became a, a landmark uh, that from then on, uh, the uh, pro-choice platform has gained ground and abortion became more and more legal. As far as I know, I, <clears throat> I, I, I believe uh, what I heard that, that uh, the Roe v. Wade decision was overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court. <clears throat> In any case, we celebrate the life, sanctity of life, uh, in January because we are very pro-life why because we are very pro-God as Christians we acknowledge this that God is the giver of life he is the giver not the taker never the taker I know some Christians believe that God takes away life that he gives us an expiration date well, that's not my understanding. My understanding is based on the Bible, what, what it says. The Bible says, Saint Paul's, in St. Saint Paul's letter to the Corinthians, it says that death is an enemy. The Bible also says in the, in the Old Testament, in the Deuterocanonicals, that God created everything for life. He, he created and particularly human beings, created us to live forever. He never invented death. Death did not come from him. Death is the product, the ultimate result of sin. And sin was the result of what the devil, not God, the devil planted, which was a temptation. He enticed our forefather, Abraham and Eve, to sin so that sin can enter, could enter the world, the good creation of God. So death did not come from God. And death is never an instrument God employs in order to fulfill His will. No. God is sovereign. He doesn't need to or have to resort to violence because it's not Him. His, his sovereignty is according to his nature, which is love and kindness and peace and joy and righteousness. Never violence, never anger. You know, uh, people try to justify God's wrath or God's anger. God's anger, if there is such a thing, is directed toward anything that destroys his good creation. You can you can uh, you can uh, discern that very easily uh, in how much he gave in restoring his good creation. He gave his own life in order to restore it. He could have just discarded his first creation and then said, 
Okay, fine. Sin warped, sin uh, tarnished my first creation. I'll, I'm God. I make something out of nothing, so I'll just come up with a new creation, right? I mean, entirely new and separate and different. No, he doesn't do that. He doesn't discard, he restores. And he restores, uh, the, uh, let me put it this way if I can, without being a heretic. But it, it seems to me like he has outdone himself. The creation was wonderful, something out of nothing. But the restoration of the fallen creation was more wonderful. Why? Because he didn't just speak things into being. He restored his good creation by giving of his own life. Imagine that. That's why uh, the second collect of I mean, the, the, the collect for the second Sunday of Christmas, I really love, out of the uh, Book of Common Prayer, I really love the collect for the second Sunday of Christmas, which uh, unfortunately we don't always have a second Sunday of Christmas. But, <clears throat> but it, it, it goes like this. Uh, God, who wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored, the dignity of human life. God wonderfully created and yet wonderfully, more wonderfully restored the dignity of human life. That's who our God is. He gives life. He doesn't take life. So we, as Christians, also are supposed to have that nature. We give life. We nurture life. We take care of life. We never destroy, destroy or take lives. Never. Never. In fact, if we have to, we give our own in order for others to have their life back. That's the pattern we get from God, right? He gives His own life for the life of the world. He doesn't say, what is good for me? at the cost of your life, right? St. Paul says, don't merely look out for your own interests, but for the interests of others. Why is there crime? Because my interests are more important than others, other people's interests. So I will impose my interest at, at their expense. I will steal from them because my need is more important than theirs. I will abuse sexually because my sexual desire is more important than their dignity, right? Or their pain. I will kill because my life is more important than others. I will kill a baby in my womb because my needs are number one. I don't care about the life of others or the interests of others. Not the example of God. Example of God, as we see in Jesus Christ, is, hey, they're dying. My children are dying because of sin. The ultimate result of sin is death, right? They're dying. They're, they're sick. They're miserable. They don't have peace. They're depressed. They're stressed. I have to do something about it. <clears throat> They're my creation. I love them. They're my children. In order for them to have life restored to them, I'm willing to sacrifice my own, to deny myself and take up my cross so that they may live. That's our God, and that's who we follow. And so we understand that. First, we need to understand that all life is sacred. That's what we proclaim. All life is sacred. Those in the womb, those who have been born, those the people we like, the people we don't like, our friends, our enemies, 
our family, our, our strangers, etc. This is what I, I tell my congregation. The term loved ones is to us, or should be to us Christians, a misnomer. Because we are commanded not to pick and choose, but to love our neighbor as ourselves, right? Good or bad, likable, unlikable, lovable, unlovable, funny, corny, uh, offensive, despicable, or nice. No, we love indiscriminately. God makes the sun to shine and the rain to fall on the good and bad alike, on the righteous and the unrighteous alike. That's who our God is. Our God is love. And love doesn't choose. Love always gives. Always gives. And so we must recognize that all life, all human life, is sacred and precious to God. It is wrong to think, and some Christians do this, but it's wrong to think that we are the chosen people and others are unfortunately not. It is wrong to think that we're blessed and they're cursed. It is wrong to think that we are forgiven and they're not. Right? And sometimes we put a limit to the mercy of God. We say the mercy of God and the grace of God only covers the, sin, the sins of people like me because we don't sin that much. Well, James says, you violate one commandment, you actually violate all. <laughs> so we're all guilty. There's none righteous. No, not one. All of us, all of us depend on the grace of God. And that grace is so great and so inclusive that no sin is beyond forgiveness. Where sin abounds, grace abounds a little. Is that what it says? Where sin abounds, no, this is what, it, what it says is where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. It doesn't say grace abounds as much but all the more, which is characteristic of our God. His grace is more than sufficient. His blessing is more than sufficient. And which is, which is why we shall not want if we realize that He's our good shepherd. He doesn't just give what we need. He always gives beyond. That's our God. That's the Father in whose image we were created. It's the Father we should take after. So, may we value life, not just our own, but more especially the life of others. The needy, especially. The least, the lost, and the lonely. And we don't pick and choose. You know, like Jesus said, don't, don't just give a party for your friends and relatives. No, invite especially those who cannot repay you. <laughs> the least of his brothers. Why? Because all life is sacred. Not just those of the 99. 99 is good enough, right? But the one astray, the one sheep that's straying, his life is sacred as well. Which is why God, Jesus, the Good Shepherd, goes after it. He looks for it until he finds it. Wow, that's who our God is. The hound of heaven, relentless in his love. And... His grace and His Spirit in us, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. So that one day, one day we shall love Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. Not because we're forced, we still have free will, not because we're forced, but because His, sovereign, his sovereignty and the sovereignty of His love draws us to be like Him influences us, inspires us, so that with our free will, we choose to be like Him, not are forced to be like Him. 
I don't know how that will happen. Sometimes I think it's impossible. Uh, when I think of myself, and to be honest, also when I think of other people, I'm not the judge. And all I know is that the word of the Lord does not return to him without accomplishing that for which it was sent. What a blessing we have and assurance of hope in our God. So we encourage you, regard no one according to the flesh, but see them and their lives as sacred and precious in the sight of God. Thank you for joining us once again. Bishop Ariel Santos here saying God bless you. We'll see you again next week on the Wednesday evening reflection.